This is Bruce Wald from the City of Scottsdale's Neighborhood College Program. We're all in this together. The City of Peoria, we're in this together. The City of Chandler, we're in this together. Hi, this is Jamie from the City of Scottsdale with my daughter, Jocelyn. We're in this together. City of Tempe, we are in this together. <laughs> My name is Beth Mulcahy, and I am the managing partner and senior attorney for the Mulcahy Law Firm in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I've enjoyed representing HOAs and condominiums for the past 24 years. Can't believe it's been that long. In one short month, it'll be 25 years. Um, my firm currently represents over a thousand planned communities and condominium associations throughout the state of Arizona. And um, I currently also serve on my HOA board and have for many years. I'm gonna be co-teaching today with a bundle of energy, Lauren Bai, um, and she's an attorney with our firm. She's been with our firm for over five years and she's a graduate of Arizona State University. And we're going to kind of go back and forth on the topics just to keep things interesting and to um, have some diverse opinions as we go forward with these classes. So, um, well, first, let's just start out by saying welcome to our spring 2021 virtual HOA Condo Academy in partnership with the neighborhood services from all over Arizona, together with the cities of Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe, we've organized these special virtual HOA and Condo Academy classes. And today's class is number four in our six series class, which will extend through June, 2021. Okay, what are we gonna discuss in today's session? Uh, basically, we're gonna give you an overview of what are your responsibilities in your association. And what are things that you need to know so that you don't get in trouble when you're serving on your board and that you are in compliance with Arizona law and that you aren't, you know, getting sued and having a lot of hassles and hating your time on the board. So we're going to try to give you the tools today that will help you make good decisions as a board and that will make your time productive so that you can get, accomplish a lot of different things as you serve on your board. We're gonna be sharing materials with you too throughout the presentation on both platforms, on Zoom and then also on Facebook Live. Um, after the presentation, we also send out a summary um, which includes links for all materials to those who registered for the class. Throughout the presentation, we're gonna be sharing with you our popular Mulcahy cheat sheets um, on several topics. And I would encourage you to visit our website at mulcahylawfirm.com where you can find our full cheat sheet library. Currently we have over 60 cheat sheets and we have a lot of, of wonderful free resources for board members, homeowners, and managers. So we encourage you to check out our website at mulcahylawfirm.com. I like to have polls during the presentations that we are doing virtually so that I can hear from you. Um, I really miss seeing all of you in person. And I know um, that Lauren, who's co-teaching the class with me today, feels the same way. Um, there's something special about having an opportunity to connect in person. And, and we definitely miss that by not teaching the classes in person right now as the pandemic is winding down. And the question is, which city do you reside in? Um, and then we give you all the different choices, Avondale or Goodyear, Chandler, Glendale, Mesa, Phoenix, Peoria, Scottsdale, Surprise, Tempe or another city that you may be living in that you're tuning in from. Um, by participating in the polls, you really help us determine who's here today and so that we can tailor our discussion um, you know, to certain cities and, and towns if we have a large representation. Okay, it looks like uh, we received our poll results and you probably can see them on your screen here. It looks like we have about 4% from Avondale, 13% from Chandler, 1% from Glendale, 9% from Mesa, 13% from Phoenix, 7% from Peoria, 19% from Scottsdale, 1% from Surprise, and 3% from Tempe, and then 28% are going to keep us guessing. Thanks for being here, everybody. It's, it's always helpful to um, you know, know who my audience is. So thanks for participating today. We're really happy to have you here. And, and as I said earlier, we, we have over 100, about 112 people that are participating today, either by Facebook Live or by Zoom. 
Okay, let's start out with talking about the new legislation. Um, as you probably, unless you're, you know, like in buried your head right now and you're not following the news, um, you know, I'm sure you're aware that that the legislature in Arizona has been very active this year. Um, there have been all kinds of bills um, that have been introduced and passed by our legislature and signed into law by our governor. Um, the one kind of unique thing about this year is that a lot of the bills are either political in nature, COVID in nature, um, you know, just mainly a lot of bills pertaining to the pandemic. Of course, we, we are seeing discussions about the budget as well. Um, hot topics, um, you know, we're seeing in, in many of these bills that are just issues that are hot topics in our country right now. Um, so it's expected that the Arizona legislature is going to adjourn on Saturday, April 24th. Um, you know, of course, the budget will need to be passed before then. And if that doesn't happen, what will occur is that um, they'll have to extend it a little bit further. But all indicators are that things are really starting to wind down right now with the legislature. So um, we anticipate within the next few weeks that that will, you know, adjourn. So there are a number of bills that are pending pertaining to community associations, but just objectively looking at this after practicing law in Arizona for 24 years, I can say that I think we're really getting to the point where there aren't going to be that many more bills that are going to be signed this year by the governor and passed by uh, both houses of the legislature. So we've been monitoring the bills uh, every week since the legislature opened in January 2021. And we've been posting a weekly legislative update on our website, um, which can be easily accessed through our website homepage at mulcahylawfirm.com. So there are three bills that have been signed by our governor in Arizona that pertain to associations. So I want to talk a little bit about those. Like I said, I think we're probably unlikely to get any more bills, although I've been surprised before. Um, but these three bills are, are of interest to associations and directly impact associations. Um, the first one is Senate Bill 1377. This deals with civil liability during a pandemic. This law will make it really difficult, practically impossible in my opinion, uh, for plaintiffs to prevail regarding a pandemic related lawsuit, so long as the association was or is acting in good faith. So if your association, you know, many of you I'm sure have heard from your insurance agents that there will be no coverage under your current insurance policies for um, if anybody sues you for, uh, you know, claiming that they got COVID-19 on, on our common areas, this bill really provides added protection and makes it nearly impossible for plaintiffs to sue the association. Um, the only time, you know, it, that you might be able to be held liable is if it's proven that the association acted in a, a grossly inappropriate manner. Okay, the next bill, House Bill 2770, um, this talks about mask mandates. And um, it says that notwithstanding any other law, a business in this state is not required to enforce on its premises a mask mandate that is established by the state, a city, a town or county or any other jurisdiction of the state. And so basically, um, you know, this indirectly applies to associations. Of course, we're nonprofit corporations and, um, you know, it says that associations are not required to enforce, you know, the mask mandate that, um, you know, we've been following for many, many months now during the pandemic. So it's just kind of an interesting kind of politically related bill. Um, you know, we still are encouraging for associations to require owners to wear masks on the common areas, um, just as a general principle for the safety and welfare of your residents. Um, and just because this bill is passed saying that, that, you know, a business is not required to, it doesn't mean that you can't have more strict requirements um, through your rules or through um, guidelines that are posted in your association regarding wearing masks. And again, I think it's important to take a look at what the Center for Disease Control is encouraging regarding mask wearing at this time, too. Okay, the last bill is Senate Bill 1722. This deals with political signs and condominiums and planned communities. And this bill extends the time a sign can be left up on an owner's property or residence property up to 15 days after the general election. Or if the sign is for a candidate in a primary election who does not advance to the general election 15 days after the primary election. 
So it just extends the time period that owners can keep their political signs up on their property. Um, there are some bills that are still pending. Um, I really think it's unlikely that we'll see these pass this year, but it's just kind of interesting to note. One was dealing with a, a bill that requires first responder flags to be allowed to be flown in HOAs and condos. Again, I, I don't think this is going to progress this year. And, and this bill obviously is a sign of the times as we're navigating through the pandemic. Um, another bill, which was pretty controversial, um, and I don't think it's going to get the support that it needs to pass this year, is a bill on political and community activity. And this bill would prevent an association from prohibiting or unreasonably restricting peaceful assembly or use of private or common elements um, on the property. Um, and this would be anything from discussing association business to really any sort of peaceful assembly that might, any topic that might be, uh, you know, an owner or a resident wants to have in your community. Again, this, I don't think this is gonna pass this year. This is a very unusual bill. This is the first time in 24 years we've ever seen a bill, you know, allowing peaceful assembly on a private property, HOA condominium property. So interesting bill. Um, the next thing um, is writs of garnishments, attorney's fees. Boy, do I wish this would pass this year. Um, maybe we'll see this come out of nowhere and, and really get some support in the last few weeks. But basically, this would give association attorneys um, the right to collect attorney's fees um, as they're doing writs of garnishment. So we do a garnishment after we get a judgment against an owner. And um, we, after we get the judgment, then we can garnish the owner's uh, bank account, wages, or rent. And it's nice that after you get the judgment to be able to automatically be able to add on the attorney's fees for the judgment. Uh, for the garnishment so that this doesn't turn into always getting behind on the attorney's fees and the homeowner can never catch up. So it would just give us some added, uh, you know, protections as we're moving forward with the garnishment to collect the attorney's fees on behalf of the association. Okay, let's do a quick little COVID-19 update in Arizona. I feel like I've been doing this now for an entire year and surprisingly, we still have things to update about once a month uh, regarding how um, our governor is issuing orders and how associations are responding to those orders. So just yesterday, Governor Ducey issued an executive order which preemptively banned vaccine passports. Um, this order does not apply to private businesses. So that's notable. So it wouldn't apply to like HOAs and condominiums because of that. In his statement, Governor Ducey continued to urge Arizonans to get the COVID-19 vaccine but stated it will not be a mandate in the state of Arizona to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Governor Ducey's order focused on state agencies, counties, cities, and towns, and businesses that are contracted by the state. But again, it doesn't apply to private businesses such as HOAs or condos. But just notable because, you know, we're seeing on the federal law or the federal side, you know, discussion of the um, COVID passport to travel, maybe internationally or across state lines. Um, now we're seeing, you know, a direct contradiction in Arizona and in other states too, saying that a, a vaccine passport will not be necessary in Arizona. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the economics of COVID. Um, since April 2020, um, CAI, the Community Associations Institute, which is a national think tank that provides really wonderful resources for associations around the country, um, they've been conducting surveys, national surveys, regarding payment of assessments and assessment delinquencies during COVID-19. And I think just our firm has done a number of polls with clients and uh, followers um, who've been following us on Facebook Live and through our Zoom seminars. And, and we've really found that there has not been an uptick in the number of owners who are delinquent in the payment of their assessments. And according to CAI's new recent survey um, conducted, which was just released on April 6th, the majority, 92% of HOA and condo owners are current with their assessments on the national level. So um, just really interesting statistics. I think our firm has been really closely monitoring payment of assessments by owners since the pandemic started. And um, we've kind of been waiting for the shoe to drop to see um, if owners are, are gonna become delinquent in the payment of their assessments. And over the past year, we have not seen any uptick in the number of owners that aren't paying assessments. So 
Um, right now, Arizona HOA and condos should not have a large number of owners who are not paying assessments. So um, the current economic climate in Arizona um, of high property values, low interest rates, low for sale house inventory, plus lots of equity in your property, combined with all, all the federal and state COVID-19 stimulus money, we think has prompted many owners to pay their assessments. And we, we really hope that that trend continues in the future. Um, because associations are dependent on that assessment money. They do a zero budget every year. Every dollar that they you know, assess against their owners needs to be paid to meet the expenses of the association. So just another comment, um, the federal government moratorium on foreclosures continues. Mortgage companies are still prohibited from filing foreclosure actions for delinquent mortgage payments and are required to provide forbearance and payment plans. And of course, that could also be a reason why a uh, you know, number of owners are paying their assessments. Maybe if they don't are as required to pay um, you know, their mortgage payments or their deed of trust payments, they're able to pay down other debt. Um, but the problem with that, if that's happening, is that at some day the jig's gonna be up and the government will lift the moratorium and then all these owners you know, will have to figure out any payments that they missed on their mortgages or deeds of trust. Um, and finally, just now that many people have been vaccinated, um, many boards are starting to ask me about transitioning back to in-person board meetings. Um, in fact, I'm having my first in-person board meeting tomorrow um, in the East Valley, um, and everybody's going to be socially distanced and wearing masks. So I think the big question is, you know, what is everybody's comfort level on uh, going back to in-person meetings? I mean, I'm going to be the first person to admit I'm a little bit cautious about this, especially based upon the demographics of many of the communities that we represent. They're at the higher risk areas, but you know, a lot of people have been vaccinated. So is it time to get back to business, get back to in-person business? So I have a poll for you. Um, I wanna hear from you. So let's try to get as many people as possible who are listening in today to let me know. Is your board planning to meet in person for future board meetings or your 2021 annual meeting? So are you gonna meet in person for future board meetings or your 2021 annual meeting? Um, and if you say yes, that means we're gonna go back and do that. Um, no means we're probably gonna just continue on with Zoom. It's working great for our community and we wanna be safe through the end of 2021, or I don't know. If you wouldn't mind answering that question for us now, it really helps give us feedback as to the pulse of everybody in Arizona on this topic. Okay, surprising. Is your board planning to meet in person for future board meetings or your 2021 annual meeting? 38% said yes, 24% said no, and 37% are probably on the fence. I don't know. Um, so I think we're just gonna have to continue to see how things go. Um, I think from my perspective, Having the meetings by Zoom has created a lot of efficiencies and um, a lot of boards are really embracing it because it allows for more participation um, from owners and from board members and um, it's working for them. Maybe a hybrid is something that we'll see through the rest of 2021 and beyond. Some in-person meetings, maybe only your annual meeting each year or um, maybe you have your regular board meetings by Zoom and only your annual meeting in person or you know, maybe a couple meetings in person per year, or maybe all of them. Maybe you go back to in person for everything. We'll just have to see. Time will tell. Okay, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about general responsibilities for board members. And then Lauren's going to switch over in a few minutes, in about uh, 15 minutes, and she's going to be talking about um, how to have a successful association. So, what are the qualities that we see in really successful associations? So, Let's start out and talk a little bit about what are the general responsibilities that you need to know if you're serving on your board or if you're a homeowner that's here listening in today, is your board doing everything that they're supposed to be doing? Or if you're a manager guiding your communities, um, these are really good guidelines that your board should be following. So the first thing that I would say is you have to participate. Um, if you're elected to your board, you cannot show up only sometimes for your board meetings and you um, you know, you really do have to engage in representing your community if you're a board member. And how do you do that? By attending your board meetings, arriving on time at your board meetings, being knowledgeable, researching board issues, and being ready to discuss and vote on issues at the board meeting. 
Um, something that I think is frustrating sometimes for boards is when we have board members that just don't come or board members that show up at the board meeting and they haven't, they're not, they haven't looked at the packet. They aren't aware of what the, you know, the big issues are for that meeting. So you don't really have to spend a ton of time getting ready for a board meeting. I've served on my board now for about 14 years and I can say on and off 14 years, I needed a little break in there. And what I can say is I look at the board packet for five to 10 minutes before the board meeting. Um, and I try to do it the night before if possible. Um, and I just spin through it quickly. Okay, these are the issues. If I have any questions and I can reach out to our manager to ask for clarification on something so that when I come into the meeting, I'm ready to go. I'm up to speed on the issues um, and I'm ready to participate. So first thing is you gotta be able to participate if you're serving on your board. Um, the second thing is reading, understanding and being in compliance with your governing documents. So if you're serving on your board, you really do have to have a general awareness of what your documents say. And so what are the documents for your community? CCNRs, bylaws, rules and regulations, architectural guidelines, um, articles of incorporation. And really what we recommend is just once a year, just do a 10 minute page through of the documents for your community. And it's great if you have a binder for your community with all of your documents in one place. So just fan through them quickly, get the lay of the land, determine um, you know, what's in each document quickly, general sections. So if a question comes up on, um, you know, can we have sheds? You would know, oh, I gotta go check the CCNRs or the architectural guidelines. I think I saw something in there on that. So just the second tip we would have is for general responsibility, read, understand, and be in compliance with your governing documents. So kind of the last part of that's important in that, you know, you cannot do anything that's contradictory to your documents. So if your documents have certain requirements like only one story homes, you really do need to follow that as you're uh, making decisions with your board. If you're not following it, you really should be talking with your legal counsel to determine whether that's a good idea or whether it's something that could potentially you know, be challenged and you could be sued for not complying with. Okay, the next uh, general responsibility of the board is adhering to your fiduciary duty to the association. Um, so if there's one thing that I say today that I want you to remember, it's this. Board members have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of the association as they're making decisions and acting in representative capacity of being a board member. So what does that mean? That means making good decisions for your association. And the, the different duties that you have are like the duty of care, the duty of self deal to avoid self-dealing, and the duty of confidentiality. So what is the duty of care? The duty of care means take time and research your decisions. Rely upon your experts, like your attorney, your management company, your reserve specialist, your insurance agent, your landscaper to give you information and then sift through that information and try to make the best possible decision with the best amount of care that you can for your community. The second duty is to avoid conflicts of interest. So the duty of self-dealing means that you can't pay yourself or profit from being on the board. And really your children, relatives, spouses, et cetera, um, you know, close friends, you shouldn't be giving contracts to those people. They shouldn't be profiting from you serving on the board. And then the last duty that I'm gonna talk about is kind of the hardest one. It's the duty to keep information confidential. And it's, it's hard when you're serving on a board. I know I've served hard time on my board. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that when, you, when you're on your board, you get the juicy scoop on everything that's going on in your association, whether you want to hear it or not. And sometimes the juicy scoop is information that you should not be talking about with others in the community who are not board members, with your spouse, with family members. And so let's give a good example of things that you should keep confidential. Anything that your board is discussing during the executive session, you have a duty to keep that confidential. So the only persons that you should talk about executive session topics with would be other board members, um, your attorney for your association, your manager. Um, those would be probably the most typical people that you can talk to about executive session topics. 
you shouldn't be talking about those with your walking group, your golf buddies, your swim aerobics crew, your wife, your husband, whoever. You need to keep that inf- information confidential. So again, the duties of being on the board, fiduciary duties are the duty of care, duty of confidentiality, and the duty to avoid self-dealing or complex of interest. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, your job as overseeing the facilities and the services in the association. So when you're serving on your board, one of the jobs that you have is making sure that your common areas are being maintained and that you're running your facilities as a business. So make sure that you're hiring licensed and bonded contractors as you're navigating, you know, doing improvements to your community, general maintenance. Um, If you're not sure if somebody should be licensed or bonded, you should check with your association's attorney or your manager. Um, A lot of boards try to, you know, be penny wise, pound foolish and hire, you know, unlicensed contractors. It's really a bad idea. Um, I could teach a whole class, frankly, and I think I am. I think that might be my next class um, where we're going to be talking about working with vendors. Um, So make sure you tune tune in next month to, to learn more about that. But the bottom line here is, you're running a business, treat it like a business. Make sure your common areas are being maintained. Make sure that when you're doing improvement projects in your community that you're hiring licensed and bonded contractors. And make sure you check the references of those contractors too. A great thing to do is to go to the Register of Contractors page, webpage in Arizona and look up the contractor's name. If they have any complaints, that's a very bad sign. Um, You really, where there's smoke, there's usually fire. And I have to tell you that in my experience, anytime an association has had a problem with the contractor, more likely than not, when I go to check the contractor's license, there's already a bunch of issues you know, listed on the webpage that they've had with other customers. Um, don't forget that if you're you know, doing a large capital improvement project in your association and you're signing a contract, make sure you run that contract by your association's attorney to make sure that the association's interests are protected. Okay, the next uh, general responsibility for a board member is overseeing the management company if you have one in place. And that means overseeing the banking, budgets for your community, making sure you have the proper insurance and that your policies are being renewed in a timely fashion, making sure your utility bills are being paid, your landscaping's being up, you know, maintained and, and proper upkeep, your taxes are being paid, your corporation commission annual reports being filed. So really you have to keep a finger on the management company. And and remember you're a team. It's not like, you know, it's enemies, right? You're a team with your management company, but they also need to have supervision. Um, You're the boss, they work for you. You wanna work together well, but you need to be double checking to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing under the contract that you signed with them and that they are, keeping your financials in good condition and that bills are being paid on time and making sure by double checking the bank statements to make sure that the money that's being paid out of the bank statements are in fact being paid on association bills. So overseeing the management company is the next general responsibility of the board. The next general responsibility I'm gonna talk about is the open meeting law. Um, And so in Arizona, we have a special open meeting law that is just for HOAs and condominiums. And what that law says is that any time a quorum of the board is meeting to discuss association business, it has to be an open meeting. And so quorum of the board discussing association business, you're going to need to give 48 hours notice to your membership. Most of our clients are doing that now by putting it on their website. Uh, Maybe they send an email, maybe they post it on the common areas in the community. Um, And you have to follow, you know, the open meeting law. Now, obviously, many of us have been conducting open meetings now virtually for the past year due to the pandemic. Um, And so we have a great cheat sheet on tips for conducting successful virtual meetings, which my team's going to be sharing with you shortly here. Um, We also have um, some wonderful resources on our webpage. Uh, on running open meetings in compliance with Arizona open meeting law for HOAs and condos. Um, So I encourage you to to look at both of those cheat sheets. Um, Some boards are meeting in person again, as we saw from our polls, some of you are definitely ready to do that. 
Um, just remember that um, if you are meeting in person again, remember to social distance. Having the meeting outside would be preferable and wearing masks according to CDC guidelines um, are all really smart ideas right now. Okay, the next uh, responsibility for the board of directors would be following and enforcing the rules, the CCNRs, the bylaws. Um, we already talked a little bit about that, getting to know the bylaws earlier in my presentation, but you also have a responsibility to enforce them. So if an owner has done something that is contradictory to your documents, such as not paying assessments, or they've you know, made a change to their property that's not consistent with your documents, your board does have the responsibility to enforce your documents. So make sure that um, you know, you're having inspections on your property and that you're acting in a timely manner if an owner gets delinquent in the payment of their assessments. Um, you also have a responsibility to be fair and consistent. So you can't treat one owner differently than another owner if they're violating the documents. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that if we send a violation letter to an owner regarding an issue, you can bet sure as I'm sitting here that they're gonna go around the community taking pictures of all the other violations and want to know if you are you know, sending violation letters to them too. So just make sure, you know, in closing on, on this small subtopic that you're treating owners the same, you're being fair and you're being consistent when you are, you know, handling enforcement procedures in your community. Okay, um, one other thing I wanna mention quickly, kind of similar to that is, you know, when you are enforcing your documents, knowing that you have the right to find an owner for non-payment of, a, uh, or excuse me, find an owner for not, complying with your documents. So for example, somebody, you know, leaves their trash cans out um, on non-trash days, or maybe they're doing overnight parking on your streets, or maybe they have a short-term rental that's not consistent with what your documents allow for. The association has the ability to find the owner. And I think the last class that we taught uh, for the Virtual HOA Academy, we talked about how to handle enforcement. So if, if you have a lot of issues with that in your community, I encourage you to go to our website and look at that particular video that we have on this. We also have it posted on Facebook Live. But basically, if you're going to fine an owner for one of these violations, the fine has to be reasonable. It has to be an actual violation of your association's documents. And you have to give notice of the violation and an opportunity to be heard before you levy the fine against the owner. So make sure that you're complying with the very specific procedure that is outlined under Arizona law for finding an owner. We have a, a cheat sheet that addresses this specifically. It's our top 10 cheat sheet. Okay, next important uh, responsibility of the board is preparing an annual budget and then adhering to that budget. Looking at that budget every year, um, you know, creating a budget every year in June, July, August, September, October for the next year. Um, and right now, you know, it's April, 2021, every single month in 2021, you should be looking at the year to date budget numbers. Are we over budget, under budget? What areas are we over budget on? Will we be able to trim in other areas so that we have enough money at the end of the year? So just keeping your finger on the annual budget and then making sure that you're doing planning for it this summer and this fall to get ready for the 2022 budget. We have a really great cheat sheet on budgeting that our group is gonna be sharing with you right now um, or shortly in, in our group chat here. Um, and so make sure you check that out if you have any questions on your budget. Um, reserve studies is another hot topic and important responsibility for serving on your board. Um, having reserve study completed and adequate funds to fund the reserve um, are just signs of a you know, successful association, of an association that's being well run. And so if you have questions on what is a reserve, what is a reserve study, how do we get a reserve study, how much do they cost, um, is a reserve required in Arizona? No, it's not, um, but you are required to disclose if you have one to your buyers in your community, and that's kind of a really important checklist for a lot of buyers. So if you have questions about a reserve, we have a cheat sheet that can help you on this. And it's just an important thing to keep on your radar if you're serving on your board. Our recommendation is you should have a reserve account for your association and you should have it properly funded. 
you know, I'm often asked how much is proper funding. I would say, you know, between 70 and 80% of whatever a reserve study says you should have in your reserve, that would be considered adequate funding. Obviously, if you can go higher to 80 or 90 or 100%, that would be best. Okay, let's talk a little bit about finances for your association. Um, we talked briefly that, you know, it's really important that your board, especially your treasurer, is looking at the financial statements for your community every month, your bank statements, the year-to-date budget. Um, you also have to have your financial records audited or reviewed yearly um, as stated under Arizona law. So Arizona law says that an association, condominium, or planned community must have an audit, review, or compilation done every year. Um, if your documents require the audit to be done by a CPA, so usually that's in your bylaws, if you have that provision, you have to have the audit done by a CPA annually. If your documents are silent as to who can do the audit, review, or compilation, the board can choose. You can have a bookkeeper, you could have a special committee, um, but you really want to have somebody who's independent. So having the treasurer or the management company do that review or compilation really isn't the best idea because you want to have somebody independent checking to make sure that your finance finances for your community are in good order. Um, also, associations, even though you're nonprofit, you are required to file taxes, state and federal taxes. Um, so you want to make sure that you are doing that every year. The taxes are typically due March 15th. Um, of course, you can get an extension. A question that I, I often get, um, and make sure you're posting your questions in the comments section on Facebook and in the Q&A section on um, Zoom. A question I often get about taxes is, uh-oh, we didn't know we were supposed to file taxes. And we've never filed taxes. So what do we do now? Now you're telling us we're supposed to be filing taxes. What we recommend is first talk to a CPA because a CPA is gonna be best suited to give you advice on this. Our recommendation and what we've seen other CPAs tell associations in the position that they haven't filed taxes before is start filing now going forward. And if the IRS or the State Department of Revenue wants you to go backwards, um, which we actually have never seen them do, um, you can always go back and recreate taxes at a later date, but start doing it properly going forward now that you know that that's a requirement. Okay, um, another thing I want to just give a warning on as we were kind of closing up this finances discussion on board member responsibilities is please, please be careful of, um, you know, keeping an eye on your finances for your community. Fraud and embezzlement is a huge topic for associations. Um, and we're gonna be teaching a class. We're starting to plan our summer classes. Um, we're gonna be doing the virtual academy through the full 2021. So we'll have six classes starting in July, going through December. And one of those classes, we're gonna spend a portion of the time talking about how to prevent fraud and embezzlement. Um, but it's something you've gotta keep an eye on if you're serving on your board. And so I encourage you to take a, a peek at our cheat sheet on fraud and embezzlement, embezzlement and preventing it. And we're gonna be sharing that with you um, in the chat and in the Q&A section here shortly. Um, the other thing that's important is making sure that your association has the right insurance. So typically you need to have general liability insurance for your association's common areas, um, directors and officers insurance so that if a director or officer is sued that there's insurance coverage to pay for the legal defense of officers and directors, and then fidelity bond in the event that somebody steals money from your association. Um, also knowing when to hire professionals and following their advice. So as a board, you should have a, you know, a dream team surrounding you of a lawyer that cares about your association and that wants to keep you out of trouble, doesn't want your association to get sued. Um, a management company who is you know, carrying out the wishes of the board, um, an insurance advisor, reserve advisor, um, a landscaping advisor, all of these different advisors to help you make the best decisions you can while you're serving on your board. Um, also important to remember that you have to file an annual report every year with the Arizona Corporation Commission to keep your nonprofit corporation status. Um, if you wanna check to see if you are in good standing right now as a corporation, our, my team is going to be sharing the link um, to you, you know, where you can go to the Arizona Corporation Commission website and look up, you know, your corporation's name, your association's name to see if you are in good standing. 
if you aren't in good standing, you want to reach out to your attorney and make sure that they can help you get back into good standing. Because if you're not in good standing, that means that every owner in your association could have personal liability for the debts of the association. Um, the last two things I want to mention before I switch over and talk with Lauren are, you know, two important things. Number one, um, it's important for your association's board to recognize that you have a duty to run a professional annual meeting. We have a great cheat sheet on this called um, Successful Annual Meetings, and we're going to be sharing that with you in the chat. Um, but it's your chance to shine. It's your chance to show the community what you've accomplished, to talk about what the financial state of affairs of the association is, to talk about your plans for the future. Um, and so you want to have a really professional, well-run annual meeting. And so we give you tips in our cheat sheet on annual meetings to help you do that. And then the last topic, equally important, is just being nice. If you're serving on your board, you've been elected to serve your community. I know you're not getting paid. And trust me, I know this is probably a job that has a lot of hassles. Um, but regardless of how mean some of the owners might be to you, or how um, you know upset they may come to a meeting, you still have to be nice. Try to have an approachable and business-like manner as a board member. Be nice to owners, even if they aren't nice to you. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears right now and I'm gonna have Lauren Vai, who's an attorney with our firm, um, give the next little short part of the presentation, about 15 minutes, talking about what are the secrets that we see of successful association? And we're gonna be sharing with you what those secrets are so that your associations can be successful too. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren Vai Esquire. Um, she's an attorney with our firm. She's a graduate of ASU Law School. She's on a roll right now with a number of, of case victories and Department of Real Estate um, hearing victories. So um, she can talk to you about what it takes to be successful from being in the trenches. So turning it over to Lauren. Thank you, Beth. Um, so like Beth said, I'm going to be talking about all the secrets that we have learned of what makes a successful association. And before we start, I want to say there is no one formula for a successful association. Um, for Beth having done this for 24 years and myself having done this for over five, I can tell you all of your associations are wildly different and your needs are different too. So what's going to make you successful will depend a lot on your specific association and the board members that you have. But that being said, we have amassed um, good tips and tricks and things that we have consistently seen in successful associations that we want to share with you because they really do make your time on the board 1000 times easier. They really do. If you take that extra effort, you will find the experience to be a lot more enjoyable. Um, and so some of those things are strong and effective leadership on the part of the board, good communication with your members. This is so key, good communication, being aware of and following the terms of your governing documents, state law, and relying on those professionals that Beth mentioned earlier, being able to talk to your attorney when you deem it necessary, being able to go to a CPA to make sure that your finances are in good shape, a reserve company, a great manager or management company that can really help lighten the load. All of these things really help you run a successful association. The one that I think is the most important is having very effective, outstanding communication with your homeowners. I really cannot overemphasize how key this is. Communicating with your owners will make your life so much easier because they will already have the information uh, that they need to make decisions. They won't be bothering you as much for additional information because they'll be able to access it on, on all the platforms that you provide it. So some ways that you can have excellent communication with your homeowners is giving the homeowners an opportunity to be to speak before or after the general session at a board meeting. Um, you can decide what works best for you if it's better at the beginning or the end, but giving your homeowners a chance to speak, whether it's a complaint that they want to voice, whether it's just a general comment, whether they have a question, that really, really demonstrates to your homeowners that one, you care what they think, you want their input, and that you're willing to give them a platform to contact you. 
we get a lot of complaints that homeowners feel that they can't contact the board or that it's difficult for them to do so. So giving homeowners that platform really helps them. It gives them an outlet, but it also helps them feel like, okay, my board does care what I have to say, or my board does care about my question. You don't have to solve their problem right then or there. You don't even have to really respond. You can tell them, thank you for your comment. Thank you for your question. We're going to take it under advisement or we'll get back to you, you know, within the end of the week or something like that. But having them be able to vocalize their concerns or questions really goes a very, very far way with your membership. Also, remember, when you are at a board meeting and the board is discussing an issue, before you take a board vote on the matter, you need to open the floor to your homeowners for comments. Their comments may in no way, shape, or form affect the outcome of your decision. You may have already decided what you're going to do. Their comments may not even be particularly constructive, but you do have to let them voice their opinion on whatever you're voting on. It's not the same as a general open forum. They need to make sure that their comments are specific to the topic that you are about to vote on, but you do have to open it to them under Arizona state law. Um, something else I want to mention really quick about opening the for, you know, having a homeowner forum is you're allowed to limit the time that they speak. You don't have to let somebody ramble on for 45 minutes because they refuse to sit down. You can say, okay, we're going to give our homeowners three minutes or a minute to speak. Or if you have a particularly packed meeting, you can say, we're going to give everybody 30 seconds. Um, the only thing I'll say about that is make sure that you're timing everybody so that everybody does get the same amount of time, the same opportunity to speak. But again, it really does go a long way with your homeowners to give them an opportunity to contact you and speak to you in person. Um, something else you can do, distribute mail, put things on your website, if you have a website, you really need to be utilizing it more, in my opinion. Not enough associations utilize their website. This is how people communicate now. We communicate via email. We find information via Google and via website. So put things on there. Make it easy for your homeowners to find the information that they're looking for. Post notices of your meeting. Put up a newsletter. Put up your governing documents. Put up, you know, approved meeting minutes or financials. You can put it in a portal so that only homeowners have access to it. But make sure that you make that information available to them easily um, and they won't be bothering you or your manager quite as much for that information. So make sure that you distribute those things regularly. Try to make sure, let's say for meeting minutes, once they're approved, try to get them up on your website within the week. Um, you know, don't leave them all off of the website for months and months. Make sure that you are able to give them that information in a timely manner. Okay. Something else you can do. I really love this idea. I think it is extremely underutilized is conducting town hall meetings. Not every meeting has to be a member meeting or a board meeting. You can simply have a town hall or a Q&A where homeowners can come and either, again, voice their concerns, tell you how they think the board is doing or what they think are the pressing issues in the community that year. And the board can just answer the questions or take them under advisement. But giving homeowners an opportunity to just maybe vent or give you their input, I think is invaluable. And I think it could help the board figure out, okay, what are our goals for next year? What do we need to focus on? What are the concerns of our homeowners? Because I know a huge issue for a lot of people is homeowner engagement. It's hard to get them involved and it's hard to get answers from them about what they're concerned about. And so if you do hold a town hall meeting or a Q&A, again, you're conveying to your homeowners, we care what you think and we care about what you're concerned about. So let us know what you're concerned about. We're not mind readers. You have to let us know. Um, so I really, really love the idea of a town hall or a Q&A. I think it will really provide invaluable information to the board in the future. Um, something along the same lines, plan social events. We have communities that hold Oktoberfest parties and Cinco de Mayo parties, or they have a social get together around Christmas or in the spring before people leave for the summer. Um, these are fantastic ideas. If you're able to, you know, allocate some money in your budget to hold these events. Fantastic. Obviously, this has gotten a little more complicated with the pandemic. I think it's safe to say people really haven't been holding these events during the past year, but um, we have been seeing associations that are starting to hold these events again. I was contacted recently about a Cinco de Mayo event. 
Um, so if you do hold an event like this before we, I don't know if we'll ever get the all clear to be out of the pandemic, but if we, you know, before we get any kind of um, approval from the CDC to say, yes, you can all get together without masks now, try to make sure that you have social distancing measures in place that people wear masks when they're not eating or drinking. But these events really do go a long way in fostering that community feeling um, and helping people feel like, again, invested in your community, that they want to be a part of your community and they want to take part in what the board is doing. Um, you can, oh, something else you can do that's really, really important, and you need to tell your managers to do this as well, is to respond to members in a timely manner. Um, we do get reports, and I, I know we're all busy, we all have a lot going on in life, and it can be easy to miss an email. But at the very least, we recommend that you acknowledge that you've received someone email, someone's email, and the same for your manager. You can't even give your manager, say, you know, hey, we last that you at least acknowledge receipt of an email within 24 hours of receipt or within 48 hours of receipt. But that way homeowners know, okay, my email has been received and it's gonna be addressed. Same with you know some kind of letter or something, something letting the homeowner know you've received it and you're working on the issue or you're going to address it. Um, something else you can do, give homeowners a number and an email to contact you at. It doesn't need to be your personal email address. And honestly, we don't recommend that you give out your personal email address. If you can create a general Google email for the association, that's probably the best way to do it. That way, all of your communications to that inbox are solely association related, but give them an email address, give them a phone number, whether it's the manager, whether it's the board president or whoever volunteers for that position, um, give them a way to communicate with you in between meetings because things inevitably are going to come up in between meetings. So giving them a, a, a way to contact you is really key. Conduct member surveys um, via SurveyMonkey. You can send out a postcard that owners can send back to you. But this is a really, really great way to determine, again, just to take the temperature of your association, what people are happy about, what they are unhappy about, but also to basically um, kind of see before you spend a bunch of money, do homeowners want you to spend money on it? You know, you can take a poll. Do you want to amend the CCNRs? Do you want to try to, you know, repave the parking lot or something like that? That's a great way to gauge homeowner interest before you make a decision. You can form a welcome committee. This is a great way to get people involved in the community. So you can have homeowners or board members that go and welcome a new owner to the community. Um, and you can also give members, this is kind of the same thing as a survey, but give them postcards that are self-addressed and already have a return stamp on them so they can send that back to you and um, let you know their thoughts or concerns. So how do, beyond communication, how do we have strong leadership in a community? Because we generally have not a revolving door of board members, but we have people coming and going, right? We, whether your terms are a year or three years, people come and go off of the board. And that leads to different, um, I guess, leadership styles in the community. And we want to figure out how to best work with everybody. Um, Qualities that we see in good board members, I mean, consistently across the board, we always see these qualities. They emphasize teamwork. They try to involve all the members of the board. They make sure everything is a board decision unless they've been, you know, expressly granted authority to make a decision unilaterally. But you want to make sure that people are participating in being a board member and feel like they're a part of the process. We find often that sometimes board presidents can kind of be those people in school who ended up handling a group project all on their own. You know, they didn't need the rest of the team. And we want to avoid that in community associations. We want to make sure that everybody is contributing on the board, has a say, feels that their input is valued. So making sure that you're playing to the strengths of the people on your board is so important. Don't make the most timid, shy, non-confrontational person on your board the president. They're going to hate that role and they won't do well. You know, maybe you make them the treasurer. Maybe you make them the secretary, kind of a backseat role. But play to the strengths of the people on your board so that you have the best possible board that you can. Something else that we really see in very um, good boards are obviously honesty, integrity, transparency, making sure you're abiding by your fiduciary duties, doing what is best for the corporation, but also being transparent. 
If you have to discuss something in an open meeting, make sure it's at an open meeting. Make sure that you disseminate the minutes after they're approved. Make sure that homeowners have a way of knowing what's going on in the community. Because if boards try to do things secretly or homeowners feel that they're not in the loop, that's when homeowners start feeling that there's some kind of massive conspiracy to spend all of their money without their input. If you're transparent, if you make all of your information that you need to make available legally to the homeowners, there's not going to be that feeling of there's a conspiracy. You can easily point them to the information that you've provided to them and say, oh, you didn't know that we made this decision. Here are the meeting minutes that were posted to our website. Um, you're obviously always welcome to attend a meeting. We make sure that they're noticed. So there's no reason for you not to come unless you have a conflict. That kind of transparency goes a long, long way in being a successful association. Something we recommend too for boards is potentially adopting a code of conduct. You can't force a member to sign this unless it's in your documents, but I think it does go a long way in setting the expectations of what you expect of your board members. Saying, we expect you to basically attend the meetings. We expect you to come prepared, look at the material beforehand, at least for 15 or 20 minutes, so that you're ready to have a thoughtful discussion and make decisions in a timely manner. Make sure that you know they understand that you expect them to communicate with members, that you expect them to communicate with board members and be an active role on the board. All of those things are so, so key um, for running a, a good board. And we wanna make sure that board members understand that going into it. If you need a code of conduct, our office has drafted them for boards before and we can help you draft something that we think will really benefit your board and your association. Again, for the board, we really do recommend that you, again, communicate with your members, communicate with your, board, um, your other fellow board members. Don't be an island. Make sure that you talk to people because if you don't communicate, you're not going to get anything done and your homeowners are not going to know what's happening and they're going to be mad about it. Make sure you're communicating in a professional manner. Make sure that you're being kind. Um, again, we're running a neighborhood. We're friends. We're neighbors. Make sure that we act in that manner. And if we promise if you do these things, you will be a more successful association and your time on the board will be much more enjoyable. Great, really good points, Lauren. Um, you know, and I think you and I can both uh, say from just going to a lot of board meetings that the boards that have the fewest problems, right? They have the longest longevity on the boards. They're Absolutely. happy. Their communities are happy. They're transparent. They're communicating well, and it just makes your job so much easier. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, I'm going to just switch gears and talk a little bit about getting things done. So one thing that we hear from boards often is we feel like we never get anything done, right? We are constantly dealing with homeowner complaints and maybe following up with our management company. You know, why hasn't this been done yet? And we, we need help on how can we prioritize things so that we actually accomplish something and feel a sense of accomplishment that we're doing things as we're serving on our board and giving a lot of our time. So some boards we know are facing serious problems like deferred maintenance, or they don't have any money, or they can't get a special assessment to pass, or they haven't amended their CCNRs in many years and they can't get the votes to do that, or they're trying to increase their assessment rate because, you know, cost of living's gone up and they can't get that passed. Um, well, what I would say is that if you are one of these boards that's facing serious problems and you don't have any answers and you can't get things done, um, you're having difficulty accomplishing tasks, reach out to your trusted advisors. So our firm is here to help you. Management company that you work with should be, should be there advising you to. Your CPA, your reserve specialist, your insurance agent. Um, and it's okay to get a second opinion. Um, so if you don't like what your management company is saying, it's okay to ask your attorney or get a separate attorney if you, you know, don't totally agree with what your attorney is advising you. Um, one suggestion that I would give you is we have a great cheat sheet called the Eisenhower cheat sheet, and it's how to get things done. And it's a method that was used by Dwight D. Eisenhower in World War II. Um, to basically prioritize the many tasks that he was facing as you know he was 
defending the United States. And so basically the method is, is that you prioritize your problems based upon urgency and importance. And we created a cheat sheet to help boards do this. Um, and it's a great guideline um, to help you take the first step, which is just let's write down all the problems. Let's prioritize based upon what's urgent and what's important. And then let's determine what we need to focus our time on so that we can um, actually get something done in the next month, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. Um, and the example on the cheat sheet is actually um, some problems that were facing my board when I got back on our board in 2016. And we had a whole bunch of problems, let me tell you. We had um, an embezzlement issue of over $500,000 being embezzled um, in the time that I was off the board. When I got back on, that was one of the joys that I had to try to figure out. Um, and we just had deferred maintenance. We had no money. I mean, it was just a train wreck, frankly. And so basically what I did is I Eisenhowered it. I put all of the problems that we had in the Eisenhower grid that we show you how to do on our cheat sheet. And then I determined what we needed to do to get things back on track. And so just a quick little war story, 2016, we were down to our last 200,000 in our association. We're supposed to have over 3 million in our accounts. Um, we're down to 200,000. We had all kinds of problems. And over the past five years, we've been able to turn around things. And now we're up to two point, over $2.3 million in our reserve account. And we're handling things. So it can be done. If you're sitting here thinking, oh, we have so many problems at my association. Where do we go from here? Reach out to your trusted advisors to help you. Eisenhower, your problems. Get the cheat sheet that we're posting in the group chat here. Um, go to our website and look it up. Um, and it will help you take the first step to you know, prioritizing the problems and moving forward to address the many problems that you may be having. Quick recap today, we've covered everything you need to know as part of a board member boot camp um, on what are your duties and responsibilities of serving on your board. We've taught you how to be a successful association. We hope everybody will go out and you know really take to heart some of the suggestions that we've given so that you can have a hassle-free, easier time on the board. Um, by following those successful tips. And then lastly, we gave you some suggestions on how to get things done. If you're facing really serious problems in your association. Thanks for being here today. We really appreciate you attending, caring about your communities, wanting to make your communities better. I'd just like to thank um, our partners for the 2021 Virtual HOA Condo Academy, um, the neighborhood services from all over Arizona, which are the cities of Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe. Our firm really appreciates partnering with you to provide free education to board members, homeowners, and managers. We would love to have all of you join us again for our next uh, virtual HOA Academy, Condo Academy, on Tuesday, May 18th at 11 a.m., class number five in our series of classes. We're going to be talking all about vendors, hiring, firing, and everything in between. Because a lot of the questions today talked about vendors and whether they need to be licensed and how to work with them effectively, we're going to cover all that. Plus, we're going to talk about how to negotiate a contract with vendors, including your management company, landscaping con company, really big projects, how to uh, negotiate those contracts the importance of using licensed and bonded contractors, how do you handle disputes, performance issues um, with your vendors, including management companies, how to end your relationship with them and come out as a win-win, and then how to find a new company if you're in the market for a, a new vendor, management company, landscaper, whatever you're looking for. Um, finally, like always, we're gonna have a Q&A session at the end of the class, so make sure you bring all your questions. Hope everybody has a great month. Thanks for joining us here today. Lauren, you did a great job. Thank you for being here. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys in May. Take care, everybody.